to Educate to Elevate. Our September episode is going to deal with listening skills. It sounds easy, but it can be really difficult. And to be able to listen, your student athletes have to be willing to talk. So we're gonna dive into how we can help cultivate relationships with student athletes, the keys to being a great listener, and what your players may be thinking but not talking about. Let's meet our panelists and get this going. Hi everybody, thank you for taking the time to tune in from wherever you are currently. Part of the work that I do and what I love about the work that I do is if you look at high-performing teams, the buzzword most often associated with high-performing teams is chemistry. And chemistry is formed through connection and at the heart of connection is communication. And that's really the place that I get to play. So my current work is with athletic departments and teams working to develop the communication skills that they need to achieve their highest success, whether that's learning how to have difficult conversations or those conversations that we typically avoid or helping coaches shorten the distance between what I intended when I said this thing and the impact that it has maybe unintentionally on their student athletes. So my background is as a student athlete and then as a coach, I coached women's college basketball for 10 years. I got to have experiences in Division I, II, III, and the WNBA. So I was at Stanford and Washington Occidental College, which is D3 in LA, and then most recently UC San Diego. And since 2015, I've been doing the work that I do now. So working as a coach, an executive coach to coaches of all sports, and a communication specialist with athletic departments and teams. I love what I do, and this whole session is my jam. So I'm excited to learn from everyone that's on the call our fellow panelists, um, and those that ask questions. We learn when you ask questions. And this is a, a situation in which there's so much that we have the opportunity to learn. So I'm grateful to be in the space. Thank you. You're welcome. Shameless plug, Betsy did a great podcast uh, not too long ago. So get in your podcast and you can hear more from her when this is all said and done also. Uh, let's go over to Deanna Gump, head coach at Notre Dame. Deanna. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm Deanna. Um, I am the head coach at the University of Notre Dame, and I've been, this is going to be my 20th season, um, so keeping fingers crossed that we get this 20th season in, um, but I've been there for 24 years, and I think one of the cool things about being there is I've had my same staff with me for one for 16 years and one for 20 years, and it's something that I'm super proud of because I believe that communication does definitely start on top, but it takes a lot of great people around you to make sure that things are going well. And we work really hard and we work really well together um, to make sure that we are communicating as well as we can. And sometimes we screw up. And like Betsy said, I can't wait to hear um, questions and other people's thoughts because we're all here to get better. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm also a mom. I have a freshman in college and a freshman in high school. Um, so that's been a fun transition these last few weeks. And um, I think probably the biggest thing that um, it, I think is the most interesting thing is over the years, your uh, priorities kind of shift a little bit. And of course, obviously, I want to win a lot of ball games, but I think that the players and um, there was those, those relationships have really changed um, over the years and what those mean to me. Um, have grown and grown and grown. And that is hands down my favorite part of coaching. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. We will move on from the University of Missouri, Dr. Scotta Morton. And Scotta, you got a whole group of Missouri people in the chat. We will not let them heckle you, uh, but go ahead and take a second to introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that there. Hopefully I don't embarrass them. I was joking. Um, yeah, so I'm Scotta Morton. I'm the Director of Mental Performance at Mizzou. Um, I'm originally from Bozeman, Montana, and I say that that I actually played softball in spring in Montana. A lot of those games turned into softball fights, um, but I'm actually originally a basketball player, so I was lucky enough to play in front of my hometown in Bozeman. And um, not, not a woe is me experience, but I, I did end up having three coaches in four years and then also experience where I had a lot of clutter get in my own way. And so that was really my, my call to care and my profession for sports psychology. Um, I went on for graduate school actually at Mizzou. I got to learn from my mentor, Rick McGuire. So he um, was a sports psychology consultant, but uniquely about him is that he was also a coach. Um, so he's a head track and field coach for 30 years. So that was a really cool lens to learn from. Um, I think again, I'm a mental performance, not mental health. And although there's a, a lot of overlap in the work that I do, primarily what I focus on is building a healthy re relationship with sport and repurposing sport and um, building an identity that can't be taken away from you, um, which is ever more so important during this time. Also happy to be here 
and can't wait to learn more from this group. Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you with us. Also, uh, we're getting we're getting crazy, bringing in some other sports all around in this one. And so I want to introduce um, Gary Reedus. Gary is at Vanderbilt, assistant women's basketball coach. Gary, go ahead, say hello, and give us a little bit more information about yourself. When you said other sports, I knew it had to be about me. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to be here. Gary Reedus. I come from Decatur, Alabama. I work right now at Vanderbilt University. Uh, on Stephanie White's staff. Uh, I mean, kind of a little bit about me. I played basketball all my life, kind of growing up. Uh, I never thought that I would get into coaching. I never thought that I would get into coaching. My sister was an assistant coach at a Division II school uh, while I was playing ball in Mexico. Uh, I had a knee injury. She gave me a call and while I was rehabbing and asked what I'd like to come in and be a graduate assistant. And I went there and was a graduate assistant. And the next year I was an assistant at Delta State University. And I was there for a year and a half and I got a call from Vanderbilt. So it's kind of crazy how it all happens. Uh, I have a, a sort of affinity for, for women's sports. Uh, I have three older sisters, so I, I grew up around, my sister played basketball at the University of Alabama, but she played softball. My dad played professional baseball, so I, I grew up around the sport. Uh, I always said if I, if I was to coach, I wanted to coach women's basketball. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to, you know, learn, grow, you know, catch up on everybody else's experiences. So glad to be here. Thank you very much. If Betsy knew she was going first, Morgan Zirkle knew she was going to go last. So Morgan, go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now, and fill us in. Hi everyone, Morgan. I am in my second year as an assistant coach at Miami of Ohio. So I'm kind of new in the coaching realm, but I hope to add a little bit of insight to this panel, being a recent player myself and still playing. So I also play professionally in the summer, I was supposed to play for the Chicago Bandits, but with COVID, um, that got pushed back. And then with our students coming later this fall, I was able to play for Athletes Unlimited. So that's the pro league that's going on now. We're in week five, but it's been an awesome experience as far as growing in the profession as well as other areas. Um, and I like to think that using my youth um, is an advantage in coaching in a way because I think I can relate to the student athletes um, probably more closely than maybe some can because I am still playing and I was recently in the collegiate experience even. Um, so I hope to be able to add that to this discussion tonight. Well, thank you very much. For at least this first question, we are going to stay in the same order. Go ahead and get those questions in, people, as you think of them. I love it. We've got uh, 70 strong, still climbing some people from the waiting room. So this should be a good one. Um, Betsy, starting with you, and this is probably the most basic question we'll get. In order for us to listen, they need to talk. How do we get them to talk more? And which I think them as the student athlete in this scenario. Yeah, great question. And it has so many different answers depending on who they are. I mean, even if you look at it through the lens of on every team, there's going to be individuals that are more extroverted, more introverted. So you put them in a group setting, like let's say a team Zoom chat. And even if you put a question into the chat, those introverts are going to need typically a little more time to process. So one way to get them to talk is send your questions in advance. If there's things you want to know, send them in advance so everybody has time to process and you're not just going to be hearing from your extroverts only. Another thing that's really helpful is if you think about, um, a classroom setting. So if we're not in our locker room, we're not with our team, if this was a classroom, there's likely certain individuals on your team that would never raise their hand and ask a question, even if they have one, because they don't want that kind of attention. And yet we put them in a uniform and then we put them on a Zoom call and then we expect everybody to answer. So really just being a little intentional or maybe more sensitive, especially during this time to how can you get the greatest response from the student athletes and how can you get the most, um, I'll say the information you need to know most so that you can take whatever kind of next step. So not just asking your questions in advance, but how are you phrasing your questions? You know, are you asking specifically for something that they're able to give you? Or are your questions so general that they don't know where to start? And so maybe they won't participate because, well, someone will say something and I don't have to. 
putting them in smaller groups, utilizing that breakout feature. Another great way, a tool I've loved using recently to get them to talk is called Mentimeter, M-E-N-T-I-M-E-T-E-R. It's a free tool to use. I now use it on almost every presentation I do. One of the features I love is this word cloud. So I'll ask a question, everyone can respond in real time and the answers are generated there on the screen and it's anonymous. So people can say what's on their mind in a way that doesn't feel like they're going to be judged for it, but you get the information that you need as a coach. And there's a variety of types of questions. You can do free form, you can do short answer, you can do polls, but it's real time information from everybody. And it has a little number counter on the bottom. So you'll know if your whole team has responded. But for me, that's been a great kind of non-intrusive way to get more information than simply throwing a question out and waiting for the crickets to stop because nobody's talking. So. Thank you. Deanna, how about you with, with your team? What are some of the ways that you try to cultivate that conversation? A lot of it is the, very similar to Betsy. Um, the one thing I, will, I always make sure I do is ask a very specific question. Um, I typically stay away from how are you uh, because typically the answer is fine. Um, so I try to be very, very specific. Um, and I ask them, I always ask them, one thing I always do is I say, what's really important to you right now? Um, and it could be family, it could be anything they want it to be. But I only do this when we're one-on-one -on -one discussions. And I, I value one-on-one um, -on -one discussions a lot because to Betsy's point, half the team in group settings and in Zoom settings don't say much at all. And it's usually the same people saying the same thing every single team meeting. Um, so I try to meet with them in very small groups and individually. Thank you. Scotta, your perspective. Yeah, usually on the Zoom medium, I'm more of a facilitator. Um, but one thing I've encouraged coaches that I work with is to actual to model that own vulnerability that they expect in their athletes. And I think that's interesting when we often ask, you know, how are you doing to our athletes? I'm fine. But when we're return the same question, usually we'll ask what's really going on there too. So if we can kind of give ourselves our own permission to feel and what's going on, um, sometimes that's a way to, to set the tone for the athletes as well. Um, other things that we've done is, is introducing them to some podcasts that might get them in touch with that idea of permission to feel. Mark Brackett's really good. He's had some great podcasts out with Brene Brown and to get them thinking before they actually come on Zoom. Um, we'll break, do some breakout sessions. And I think another thing that's worked well is giving them more ownership over those Zoom meetings. So giving some of the captains or seniors of the team to actually organize an activity or an exercise. We've done some around positive psych psychology interventions with writing gratitude journals, um, doing random acts of kindness, values in action. If you go to via, via.org, you can find more about your five signature strengths. Um, so again, getting more ownership and autonomy when they jump on the exercise, so it feels like more it's a, um, um, everybody's at a higher participatory le level. Thank you very much. Uh, Gee, how about you? What are the ways you communicate with your athletes in, in hopes that your athletes will communicate with you? As simple as it may sound, I talk to them. Uh, I mean, I, I think in our sport, you spend so much time re recruiting these kids and you build, you know, different types of relationships with each of them. But I talk to them and I'm a talker. So, I mean, I talk a lot. Uh, and a lot of times it starts off with me just talking. You know, the ones that are pretty quiet, they don't say much. You know, I may sprinkle in some questions that I know they have to answer, you know, but if they don't want to talk, I don't really make them talk right away. But kind of what I've learned over the years is that, you know, the more you keep talking, the more you open up to them, you know, the more they get a little more comfortable with you each and every day, you know, and eventually they start talking to you. And from there, you know, you talk, so I mean, it's as simple as it may sound. Like, I really talk to them. I, I talk to them, I, I'm open and honest. You know, I try to build genuine relationships. You know, I try to make sure that they know that not only am I being honest with them, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a regular person too. So, you know, the, the same way that I want them to talk, and somebody just said it, like the, the same way that I want them to be open and honest with me, like I do the same with them. Thank you very much. Morgan, let's go player perspective first. Were, were there keys for you to communicate? Do you think it was different for some of your teammates? And then how do you do that now as a coach? I think one key to getting 
um, a player or a coach to speak freely with you is you have to relate first on a level that's maybe outside of softball. So the information you probably want is like, we're always talking softball, softball. So if there's a common factor that you can have with your athlete, such as, you know, maybe it's baking or movies or them having a dog, something that you can just talk to them that's easy for them to talk about. And that can easily segue into, you know, building a trust and relationship so that they are more open to talk to you about a family member being sick or something they're really dealing with. And then that's, you know, an opportunity then you can get them help that they need in more serious situations. But I think it starts with the simple relationship because I think there's an intimidation level between a player and a coach. Um, as a player, you, even though you don't want to admit it, you see your coach kind of is up here and you don't really know if there's someone you can just talk to. So I think as a coach coming off as, you know, I am your superior, but like I'm going to understand your feelings and I want to try to be there for you for different things. Um, so trying to relate on a, a different level than just softball, softball, or our sport all the time. Thank you. Deanna, we're going to come back to you with this one. You talked about it a little bit of what's the best variation of how are you or how are things? Well, so for everybody on the panel, what are some of your favorite questions to ask? And when do you ask them versus a group versus one-on-one? -on -one. So Deanna, you kind of hit on that a little bit. Let's get, have you get it started. Yeah, I, I always, I always try to say what's important to you or what's important right now in your life. Um, because I, I think Morgan hit it on the head. I think when they realize we care about them off the field more than we care about them on the field. Um, that, at least that's what I'm trying to, you know, let them know that, listen, I, softball is great, but what's important to you right now? And it's not softball. Um, so that, to me, um, typically gets things going in the right direction. Gary, let's come over to you. Questions that you really enjoy asking? <laughs> What's up? How was your day? Well, what you got going on? Really simple questions. Honestly, I mean, I think you can kind of tell. You you learn the, these kids, they communicate a little differently with, with in different ways. Uh, you may see a post on Instagram that they put on their story that can give you kind of some insight. So you may know that they may talk about being stressed. They may talk about, you know, being upset about something. So a simple, hey, you know, what's going on? How are you? You know, and sometimes it, it, it works, but a lot of times, you know, you find out that simple questions they they kind of go a long way a lot of times they just want somebody to say something to them you know a lot of times they may feel like they aren't being heard so you know i, I think when when you make them feel important kind of you know when you kind of pull them to the side put your arm around them hey what's up you know how have things been going how how's your mom how are your parents what, whatever it may be like i i think anything really really simple Thank you. Scott, how about your take? Are there things that you encourage coaches to do? And is there a difference? You hear Deanna talk about it, G talk about it, head coach, assistant coach, you know, the, the type of personality and, and kind of kid? Yeah, I mean, I, would, I bounce off the same thing. And I, I think one also question you could ask is what's present for you in this moment? So they can actually kind of label the actual feelings that they're having. I, mean, I, I got this from Mark Brackett too, but to be more of an emotional scientist than a judge, ask a lot of questions really listen and be open and be present. Um, sometimes even just the prompts of, can you tell me more about that? Share more and really try to understand, you know, really maybe what be, might be the trigger behind that emotion. As the tendency is to want to come back to our lens, right? And, and wanting to fix and wanting to help rather than just to let them have that permission. Thank you. Betsy, same question. What, in general, what are your thoughts on this? There's so many things I want to say, like that we could go, I think, just on this topic for the rest of the conversation if we wanted to, again, because it depends so much on who are you having the conversation with. And I appreciate that Deanna said, you know, some of the most impactful conversations are those one on one conversations. A go to that I like to use and that I encourage coaches to use is the three W's. So what are you working on? What are you worried about? And what's a recent win that you've had? And that can be kind of a conversation opener. And then you can pick anything that they said in response and then go down that path if you want. 
I want to circle back a little bit, you know, when, when those student athletes say fine and you know they're not fine. I just did a video series on Instagram. If you go to Betsy underscore the coaches coach, it's on engaging with apathy. So because we've been in this space for so long, what we're seeing with a lot of our student athletes is they've gone a little bit numb and rightfully so, because it's like they thought they'd have sports back by now and they don't. And now they're in the same spot and it's been six months, but we don't feel like we made a lot of progress. So a lot of them, it hurts. It's hard to feel right now. And so because they have school to focus on, because they have other things that need their time and energy and effort, they've taken a step back emotionally. So it's a three-part series and the acronym I use is AVENUES, which is how I like to, to give a path forward for people who are trying to connect with someone who's become apathetic. And it's, if I can remember, it's AVENUES stands for acknowledge, validate, empathize, non-judgment, understand, enable, and show up. So it's like a path of how do you do that? What does that look like for someone that keeps saying fine when you know they're not fine? And Deanna, I love that question of, you know, like what's the most important thing we need to be talking about today? To come into a conversation, and I think it was Susan Scott in Fierce Conversations that said it best. She had this line, she said, be here, prepared to be nowhere else. And we always talk about being present in a conversation, but that second part of prepared to be nowhere else, like what do you need to do to clear the space, to hold space in conversation with the person that you're talking with right now, prepared to be nowhere else. And I love that. Great information. Thank you. I got the three W's. I did not get the acronym. If you want to drop that in the, uh, in the chat for us, um, Morgan, you sit and listen to talking about a little bit. What was, what was the key for you? You know, coaches help you and where did, where did you go when coaches would ask you questions? Well, I think that's the key right there is to ask the questions. I think sometimes we just don't ask the, ask the hard questions or different questions. And there's a lot of different opportunities that probably come up that you could put those in where we don't normally don't. So it's kind of just taking the time to ask the questions, whether it be like, okay, give me a high and low for this week. Or um, I know that some universities, I'll steal this from Florida State, and we've kind of done it here at Athletes Unlimited, before, before we step on the field every day to kind of just talk and do something other than softball, we have like a prompt or an exercise. Um, and some of the questions are like fun and light to get people talking. And some are like more serious questions that you kind of get an idea of the teammates on your team. And I think that's important, um, not for just a coach to get a sense of how the players are doing that day with some of the responses, you can just kind of tell um, by the response that day, but then it also makes the connection between the team better. And that's important too, because when the players are comfortable with their teammates, then they're going to open up with you more and gel better overall and just be more open to speaking. Thank you. You know, once you ask the question and you, and you get a response, I'm guessing that sometimes, at least in my personal experience, the response is not what you were expecting. Probably, especially if you're asking a, what are you worried about? Or, you know, what's, what's present? How do you respond to something that came out of nowhere? You really, you really are caught off guard. Betsy, let's start with you. You know, what should the coach do next? And then we'll, we'll go around the horn again. Yeah, you said that. And right away, I was like, ooh, like, I get nerdy about this, because for me, that's exciting. And one of the things, you know, we talk about listening and the importance of listening. A question I encourage people to ask to start to strengthen their ability to listen, especially when they're in conversation with someone they feel like they know well, is to continually ask that question, what can I learn? What can I learn? What can I learn? So if we're throwing a curveball, because this is softball, right, or maybe a drop ball or a change up, and we get an answer that is not at all what we expected, that's great because it's information. Now, it might be completely new and hit us hard and we're, we're a little bit taken aback by it. Getting curious, cultivating that quality of curiosity is the best piece of advice I can give. You don't have to have an answer. And I think as coaches, oftentimes we get hit with something unexpected and we jump into fix it mode. If you can stay in curiosity, even with the phrase like, you know, tell me more about that. Or like, that's really interesting. Or even the one word they do this in negotiation tactics, you know, they're like, well, I've got this thing that was really disappointing. And you just say, disappointing? they're going to tell you more, like pick that keyword or phrase, make it sound like a question, and they're going to continue down that path. But stay in that space with them and be curious about this new information. Try not to judge it. You don't have to do anything with it. You just got it. Like you just got it. It's new. It's fresh. Let's give it some time to settle in a little bit. 
start with curiosity. That's a great place for a next step in that conversation. Scott, any thoughts on, on that, how you would uh, encourage coaches to deal with that situation? Yeah, I just reinforce what Betsy shared, but I also think if it, if it surprised you, it probably took some courage on their end to share with you. So even by sort of thank you, I appreciate you sharing that. <laughs> That'll give you a pause, a moment to go, oh, wow, can I wrap my head around about what they just shared? But then leaning back to that curiosity, leaning in, um, I know it's, we have the tendency to want to armor up too in those situations, but if we can tell ourselves to stay in the hard thing, something, is, something great's about to happen here to where we can get to, with each other and exploring this together. Um, but definitely, thank you. Deanna, how about you? Have you been taken aback by some of the times you've asked that question and what's your next step? I'm sitting here laughing because I wish I had this discussion about 20 years ago or even 15 years ago because <laughs> I was like the fixer, like I need to fix it. And it didn't matter what it was. It could be the most ridiculous thing, but I was always trying to fix it. Um, and it took a long time for me to stop trying to fix it. Even in my head, I try to fix it. I realize I have to keep my mouth shut and just keep asking questions um, and, and let it sit for a minute because I typically do a better job communicating when I don't react right away. Thank you. Gary, how about you? Any, anytime you've been kind of taken aback and do you even question where to go next? I'm taken aback a lot by <laughs> a lot of the stuff that I hear, like, our players say that a lot of them are very open, like they're very open and they say things that, you know, you may not have said when you were a player to a coach. So, you know, like I heard a couple people say, like, just being a little curious. I mean, you know, you got to let them talk. You, you have to let them know that, that it's a safe place, you know, but a lot of times I just let them talk. Like when, I'm kind of taken aback. I just kind of let them take the lead. Whatever it is that, that they want to let me know, whatever it is that, that they feel, you know, okay enough with telling me, I just kind of let them take it there. Are there times, G, just as a follow-up, that as a male coach, you're thinking, oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. Is it in that you're, you know, you just are, are curious? We have a couple questions. We'll get to some of them a little bit later, but from the registration form of, you know, as a male coach or, you know, as an older coach or if you've you ever felt that way and any advice for those male coaches? Yeah, I, I think you have to set boundaries right away. And I think that there are some boundaries that, you know, you may not even have to speak on. You just kind of set them. I know one boundary that I have, I, I have a cutoff date or not a cutoff date, a cutoff time to where players can contact me, you know, because I'm a 31 year old man and these players are 18 to 24 year old girl. I don't want them to think that they can contact me at any time of the night. And, you know, if that's something that they ask me, I let them know, like, look, my phone is off at this time. I have a one year old, you know, <laughs> I don't want to wake him up anyway. You know, but a lot of times that there are just certain boundaries that you have to have. And as a male coach, it's difficult at times kind of finding that balance between making sure you're always there for them and always, you know, somebody who's listening to them and, you know, still making sure that, that you're doing the things that, that are appropriate and that you are, you know, kind of protecting yourself. So, yeah. And, you know, Morgan, I kick it over to you. It, it might be the opposite. You know, someone who's really close in age, some of the players, and you talked about it earlier, it helps you connect in some ways, but in other ways, it might make it more difficult to find that boundary and, and be the, the coach role. Any thoughts you've had or any, anything early in your coaching career that has, has stood out to you? I think it's sometimes tough when you are on campus and naturally you look younger, like some of the college students still. So, it's important, I think, from the get-go to just establish that, you know, I'm on the coaching side and you're on the athlete side and um, we have to respect each other in that means. But at the same time, I do want to be able to connect with them and relate to them on any way possible. Um, but that's just kind of, you have to start from the beginning knowing that they still have to respect you. And I think building a relationship with them, they're going to build that respect um, as long as you make sure you um, – make the conversations go the right way and don't, you know, enable them in any kind of like complaining or 
um, things that can happen like that, but be more of an encourager and, you know, push them. Um, I think when you have a relationship with them, you can, you know, push them in ways that um, a coach that can't relate to them, like struggles to get more out of them. Um, so it can be positive. Absolutely. Uh, Dean, I'm going to come back to you on this and, and we'll circle around. How about when you hear players say, my coach is prying. Like, when do you, when do you know when to stop? So the, the athlete says something and you're thinking, you know, there's a reason she's saying this. There's a window. You're asking follow-up questions. And then the next thing you know, you're getting an evaluation or a call from an administrator, you know, that you're prying and, and going into, you know, an area where you shouldn't be. Any thoughts on the limits, how to define the limits and navigating that space? And uh, Samantha, we're probably going to loop you in on this at the end. So that's just your fair warning. Go ahead, Deanna. I would say that as long as you let the athlete um, take the conversation and let it go her direction, I think that you're kind of safe. Um, if you, I think there's a, you know, every relationship you have with each player is a little bit different. And obviously some, one question for one player isn't prying, but that same question to another player is totally prying. So I think it's just, to me, I let them kind of take it, and then um, I go as far as they really want to go. And and I, it, it's really, and I think it has to do with just their comfort level of, you know, with you. And it, you have to be okay with it, regardless of, you know, if it if you feel like it's enough or if you don't feel like it's enough. It's not about you. It's about them. So I let them guide it completely. Thank you, uh, Scott. Let's go to you on this one. Any any thoughts there? Um, I, I think m more in my role, how I see it with that prying thing is that, I, that I've learned that I have to, that I can't be willing to do more than that they want to, more of the work. Um, and I found that when you find an athlete you want to get to, you want to tr try, you want to support, and yet they're just not showing up and it's frustrating, but also acknowledge I can't be the one wanting to work more, you know, and, and wanting to get you along. And that helps me spend my energy in other kids that are really have a desire to grow and and sometimes those kids come around, but, but everybody shows up in that point for that growth mindset and that time to learn and really lean into this type of work. And it's, it's a little bit different by years and age and experience. Um, but they've got to be the ones wanting to do the work. They've got to initiate. They've got to be proactive. I can't want it more than them. There, I said it better articulately there. Can't want it more than them. Thank you. Betsy, your thoughts? And I know it's frustrating having been a coach when you come in contact with a student athlete, it's like, but I do want it more than them. And if they could only want it half as much as I do. For me, when I hear this prying question, that brings to mind the book, uh, Crucial Conversations, which if you haven't read it yet, fantastic book, get the second edition, that's the most up to date. One of the tools that they talk about in that book is this idea of a contrasting statement. And a contrasting statement is a don't do statement. And you can typically use it in one of two ways. You can use it at the beginning of a conversation to avoid a miscommunication, or you can use it the moment that you notice safety has been threatened in a conversation. So safety, as they talk about it in communication, is typically when you see someone resort to either silence or violence, and sometimes it's both. But when they start to withdraw or shut down or you're not getting the eye contact, or they start to blame or defend or get, you know, increase in volume or a change in tone. When you notice that happen, something about their safety in the conversation has been threatened, which could coincide with prying. So using that contrasting statement, an example would be, um, you know, Deanna, I don't want it to seem like I'm prying into your personal life. I did see something on Instagram that was concerning and because I care about you, I do wanna make sure I follow up. It's a subtle thing, but it clarifies your purpose and intention so that it's less likely for them to say, oh, coach is totally prying, like acknowledge it, name it. I don't want it to seem like I'm prying. I do care about you. And so I need to follow up with you with something that was concerning for me. And then like Deanna said, let them take it where it goes and, and respect that, like follow that, watch for signs that they feel maybe their safety has been threatened and then take a pause, take a step back. Thank you very much. I gave you warning, Samantha. I'm gonna bring you in. Uh, for those of you that don't know Samantha Ekstrand, she's the legal counsel for the NFCA and often works with coaches uh, when they find themselves in uh, precarious situations. But I'm sure you've seen this from a different perspective. Any, any thoughts and tips? 
I mean, Joanna blew my cover. That was my follow-up question. <laughs> I didn't um, say that you asked the question. <laughs> you kind of, anyways, I, I'm just, I'm curious because it's a complaint I hear. It's a complaint I hear about coaches that it's, you know, and especially um, those coaches who, who do love to communicate, right? And, and so they, and they care or they're, they see something wrong and they're trying to address it. Um, and then the walls go up and that allegation happens and what, in, in how administrators hear that, I think it's alarming. It's like somehow the coach has transgressed a, a boundary that they shouldn't have. So I just was very curious to see, hear from our panelists, you know, how do you, how do you navigate that? And what are some ideas so that I can, you know, go back and, and relay those. So I think it's a great, great conversation and some great resources. I'm taking lots of notes. Can I add one tool? before we move forward. So this is something, and again, I wish we didn't have to do this and that it was a safe space for coaches to be able to have these vulnerable conversations, trusting that information that's put on an end of season form isn't gonna come back to possibly end their career. One thing that has become a best practice for some of the coaches that I work with is, and you can frame this as a communication exercise. Um, it's sort of a cover your ass thing, but let's frame it positively as a communication exercise where if I have a meeting about an important topic with a student athlete, whether or not another coach is present in that meeting, and I know for a lot of us having someone else there as a third party sort of witness is, we feel is safer. The communication exercise would be at the end of the meeting, ask your student athlete, you know, sometime this afternoon or you know, by the end of the day, shoot me a quick email with what you took away from the meeting so I can make sure that we're under, on the same page and I'll do the same for you. So make it reciprocal, but that way you have in writing exactly what was talked about from their perspective. So if there's any incongruencies, if there's anything that was miscommunicated unintentionally, you have the opportunity to correct it in real time before it becomes something that sits until the end of the season feedback and then is brought up with your administrator as a flag when it didn't need to be. So just a small thing that you can do, especially around conversations that you might be worried they left with a different understanding than, than your purpose for the meeting. Good information, thank you. Well, we've talked about you know, how to ask great questions and how to hopefully facilitate some conversation. So I'm assuming that you guys have all done this because you're the panelists, you're the experts. So what are your players talking about and how have your coaching staffs, how have people on your campus responded, especially when we are in, you know, a time where there's so much uncertainty. We, we talk about it a lot, but between, you know, coronavirus and between policies and procedures and, you know, social justice movements and so many things that are on the minds of your student athletes. Uh, Gee, let's start with you. Uh, what are your kids talking about and, and how have you incorporated their thoughts into action with your team or deeper conversations with your team? I mean, especially before we got back on campus, uh, man, we, we've had tough conversations, you know, and, and I think that some conversations are, are tougher, you know, some, they're tougher for some than others, uh, especially the, the, the social justice thing. I, I think, you know, with that, I think our team is, you know, we have 15 players, 13 of them are, are, are black girls. So I think that, that they're going through this and a lot of times they don't know how to feel, you know, but one common theme among all of them is that they're scared, you know, they're scared. They don't know how to feel, you know, they, they start to talk about mental health a, a whole lot more. And a lot of what we did, we, we, we had open forums. We let them talk, you know, we, we just kind of let them say however it is that they felt like, we did a lot of check-ins with them. I know, you know, FaceTime calls, random FaceTime calls, group Zoom calls, you know, position group Zoom calls, whatever it may be. I think we did a whole lot of talking, you know, letting them let us know how they feel, but also, you know, especially with me, letting them know how I feel in this climate, you know, because a lot of times, you know, and I, somebody said it earlier, like once we let them know, once we're a little vulnerable, they'll kind of see that we're humans too, you know, we're a coach and, you know, we're in a position of, of authority, but we're humans. Like the same things that are affecting them, like I'm scared of, you know, my son getting COVID as well. Like I don't, you know, he was born with, you know, a heart issue. So I am terrified of that happening. So when I say certain things like that, I'm open enough to say those kind of things to them. 
you know, and then they may let me know something that's going on in their household. You know, one thing that, that our players did, they wanted to put a video together, you know, so we all kind of came together and they were like, this is what we want to do. And they wrote the script, they put it together and with iMovie or whatever, and it was done. And, you know, I think that that kind of opened them up to really feeling like we understood a little bit better and, and kind of had their back a little bit. So I just think meaningful conversations, I think that, that that's one way, especially in this climate, especially not being able to go anywhere, you know, and getting on social media and seeing the crazy stuff that you see every single day. You know, I think that a lot of times you need to talk about it to somebody, even if it's not us, you know, we, we use what we call a, a, a culture coach, you know, that a lot of our players have a whole lot of conversations with. So finding somebody to talk to, finding somebody that you can trust, you know, finding somebody that, that can understand that relates. So a whole lot of talking. Thank you. Morgan, let's go to you. What, what's your team talking about? Because you're playing right now. You know, you're surrounded by athletes, might be a little older, but um, what's, what's the conversation? And, and have you thought about how you might take that back to campus, you know, and, and spending time with your team? Yeah, we have had a lot of conversations here, which has been a huge a plus to this environment. Our little shield is just the conversations you're able to have because we can't do much else. Um, and we've had these Friday Night Lights conversations and the recent ones have been on the LGBTQ plus community, um, racial inclusion and diversity. And then um, last week was body image and kind of that stuff. So hard, hard topics. And I think one, um, how we started off every week has been with speed dating. Um, so one minute you talk to one person and we have 56 athletes. So that's even more than a college team, but you're talking one-on-one -on -one to someone and then for a minute and you switch. And each time the question gets a little tougher. So it starts pretty generic and then the question gets tougher as you go. But I think that's a good way um, one to get some of your athletes talking to people that they wouldn't normally talk to. Um, and then it switches. So they get a lot of touches on each other. Um, so I really like that exercise of speed dating with some of those hard conversations. Um, and then I think education on all of them is important. We know that, but kind of letting them choose how they want to educate themselves. So um, with Miami, we kind of said, um, you know, what, whatever you want to do, watch a documentary, read some articles, do different things. And next week we'll, we'll just talk about it. Um, and kids are smart, you know, they're in college. They're, they're probably smarter than me in a lot of ways. And just listening to some of the stuff they have to say, I think you can learn most from letting them talk about what they've learned um, because they're, they are going to be proactive and they're curious. They're all over the internet. Um, so they're going to have things to say and it's just giving them the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Morgan. Deanna, what about you? What's your team thinking? What are they talking about? And, and what are you doing as a staff? Yeah, so we're in person right now. Um, and so COVID has become a huge, huge stressor and anxiety for the team and for everybody on campus. Um, so one thing that we did, I think that really helped them is we let them come up with our team standards um, for COVID. And then they decide if they did a great job with that, they get to wear green on Friday. So it's just like a, a thing that we do to kind of reward them um, for doing a great job of keeping your standards higher for COVID. And our team came up with the standards that are actually tougher than the university standards, which is really cool. Then they choose, and then they decide at the end of the week, did we do a great job with this? Um, and if they did, then they're wearing green. If they didn't do a great job with it, they're, they're not wearing green, but that's okay. And then we figure out what can we do better the next week. So that's kind of helped reduce anxiety. Um, as for um, the social justice matter, it's been, it's been a, a really interesting dynamic. And it's been, I think, really good for our team because they've been asking more questions for some of our kids with color. Um, or of color, and they've had, they're asking more questions, which I think is really important. Um, we also created kind of a, we call it the Unity Council, but a committee on our team that kind of 
helps the whole team come up with things that we can do to help. Um, because a lot of the girls are like, well, we don't know what to do to help. And, you know, we don't know what to do to help sometimes, except to keep asking questions and keep the conversation going. Um, but this group on my team, and they got to choose who, who decided to be on this council, um, they're actually doing things for the team and kind of putting us out there a little bit more, which I thought was, um, it's been really good uh, for the girls. And then also voting. Um, and we are taking that day off. So November 3rd is off completely. We're doing nothing except making sure that they vote. So we're trying to get them to do more and, and take the reins on all of this stuff. Thank you very much. Betsy, let's go to you. Uh, and then Scott, I will come back to you. Uh, it's interesting timing with this question. On Sunday, uh, this past Sunday, I had an opportunity to work with a friend who's a, uh, a mental skills specialist and the two of us facilitated an open conversation for just over 300 student athletes in division three. And the only purpose of the forum was to, to talk about what they were thinking during this time, what questions they have, what's on their mind. And it was interesting, I pulled it up for this conversation, an email that came from one of those student athletes. And the highlighted part that I have is this individual said to have someone say, oh, I'll preface it with them saying, you know, um, acknowledging our struggles, physical and emotional, was really appreciated. A lot of people right now are saying things like, oh, you'll be able to do whatever sport soon, don't worry, or, oh, if you can't run, you can always access a pool. To have someone say, yeah, that sucks, I can relate, and here's some helpful things to think about doing that won't overwhelm you with guilt about practicing or not practicing, working out or not working out, you're in the right place, was very comforting. In a time where not a lot of people, including adults, don't know what's happening, it felt good to get some solid sport-related information. And I bring that into this conversation to say that I think oftentimes as coaches, we feel a responsibility to have answers. And this situation has too much uncertainty for us to have those answers right now. So we talked about kind of that admission of vulnerability at the beginning of this call. And that for some people can be counterintuitive to what they think of when they think of leadership. I'm the leader, I'm the head coach, I'm supposed to know, I'm in the position of authority, I'm responsible for these individuals. One thing that's fascinating about this generation, Gen Z student athletes, all of the research points to the fact that they love to co-create. So what an opportunity for us as coaches to step out of that knowing position and into a collaborative position side by side saying, you know, in the way that Deanna just mentioned, like, how can we support each other? You know, what do I want to do? So for me as a coach stepping back and saying, what is it that you need during this time? What feels supportive for you? How can we help facilitate making that happen? What do you all want this time to look like? And make them responsible in a way for, for who they get to show up as in this space, whether this space is in relation to having their sport or not having their sport, and what that identity or loss of identity means, whether that's who am I in the fight for social justice and equality and, and in against racism, like whatever it happens to be, making it collaborative instead of here is the resource, here is the answer, to empower them to have conversations that tell us what they need and want is one of the most supportive things I think we have the opportunity to do during this time. Thank you. I think you're right. So often as coaches, we're fixers. That's what your job is. You know, you just see it as I'm going to, I'm going to fix this on the field. I'm going to fix this. And, and so often that uh, really takes away from the reality of what the student athlete is experiencing. And, and it's, you know, it's something that is, is lived and doesn't have to be fixed, you know, maybe just needs to be noticed and, and uh, just validated a little bit. Uh, let's go, Scott, I, I know your campus, you've had a lot of things that you going on. There've been a lot of student led you know, movements and what have you seen with student athletes? What's important? What are they talking about? And how are you helping coaches facilitate these times? Yeah, I, I'm actually gonna steal this from Brene because I just listened to her latest podcast, but she kind of calls this time we're in as, as day two in the messy middle that we've, first it was a FFT, a freaking first time for us all. And there was adrenaline and there's excitement. And now we've kind of lost that. And we're at the point of no return. We can't go back. And yet we quite don't know we're really heading we don't really see that light at the end of the tunnel either. Um, so we know that as a wall, we've kind of hit the wall. And I've seen that for athletes with a pandemic, with social justice. Um, and so one thing that really re resonated with Brene in that podcast is she said, you know, what it, would it be like to be a little bit more human right now for all of us? What would it be like to be a little bit more honest? 
And I think that sets us up for what Betsy was just talking about, some of those questions. So um, I actually did get the opportunity this last weekend to have uh, my first social distance mental performance meeting um, with one of our teams, you know, and so even I had a little anxiety about that, making sure we were following all protocol and that we make sure we cleansed in between meetings before the men's and women's team shifted. Um, but anyway, four questions that we had them come prepared with, well, actually I'll share with three, it's similar to Betsy is, one was what is something that you've learned about yourself in the past six months? Um, two was uh, how do you wanna show up for your teammates? What values do you wanna lead with? And then three, uh, I think Betsy just hit home there is what do you need um, or what, what I need from you? And the coaches let off. You know, they four talked and they really set the tone for the meeting and then each of the athletes went one on one. And I'll share with you, um, you know, men can do this. In fact, they did. They were great. And we had one of our athletes that said, you're speaking to, to another teammate and you said, you know, dude, at the end of uh, workouts the other day, you came up to me. You said I looked as chiseled as Michelangelo. And, and that made me feel good. You know, of course, that made everybody laugh in, in that meeting really set the tone for that too. So um, I think we can more set up moments for that, like you said, that shared vulnerability and that co-creating that you're sharing, that you're talking about. I um, was getting a little back that sense of connection back. But yeah, we've hit the wall, we're in the middle. So we, we just gotta get honest what we're, where we're at and what we're feeling. Thank you. Uh, another question that came from the registration form is, how do we create safe spaces for players to have conversations when there might be a difference of opinion? on some of the um, topics that are, you know, at the, at the front of a lot of people's minds. So um, anything that, that you can, can think of that you've done to create those spaces? G, let's come back to you and uh, we'll just go around again. I think it starts from day one. Uh, I think it's hard to, when a space hasn't been, you know, at least safe-ish, you know, to create a safe space out of nowhere. You know, I, I think that, again, it's going to take a, a, a lot of meaningful conversations and, you know, meaningful dialogue. You don't have to agree on everything. You know, I, I think that that's what makes, you know, America, America, sports, sports, the, the world, everything. Like, I, I think that's what makes humans, humans, you know, I don't think you have to agree on everything, but I think that you have to, I think it's good to talk some things through sometimes and, and get people's, you know, perspective on things. So as long as, you know, from day one, like just having those intent, being intentional kind of about what you're looking for and what you expect and, and kind of what you want that safe space to be, you know, and I think that, that these kids will, they'll open up to you if they feel safe, but if they don't, I think you're going to have to do a whole lot of work and, and what that works look like, what that work looks like. I think it's different for different kids, you know, if they're open to it, you know, is it meeting in a group and talking out, you know, is it a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, is it going somewhere and sitting down and, and talking, you know, is it, it could be a whole lot of things, you know, I, I do think that it starts from day one, though, that that's one thing is really, really important for me, you know, from day one, like I said, we're recruiting, you know, a lot of these kids, you know, I, I think that just being really, really intentional about letting them know that, that they are safe with you, you know, and they are safe with your entire staff. And, you know, asking hard questions from the beginning and having tough conversations from the beginning, you know, I think it'll go a long way. Thank you. Deanna, anything to add on that one? I, what I've learned um, from my team is that they love one-on-one -on -one conversations and the more that you move into season and the closer you're in the middle of games and you're in the thick of things you tend to stay away from those um, because you're busy because we're all worried about what's happening um, but what i've learned is that we have to make time for those even during season because sometimes it is like you expect them to know, it could be about playing time, it could be about their family, it could be about their dog, it could be about their significant other. Um, it just could be about how they're feeling. But I, I think my biggest takeaway has been trying to find a time to have those individual conversations even during season. And the only way that I feel like that we've done that even slightly well is that you, you 
you just go for a class a week and one coach hits one class and use your director of ops or use your volunteer coach or you, just so they have somebody act, actually taking the time to spend 20 minutes with them outside of the field. Thank you. Morgan, I'm, I'm curious a little bit with the conversations that you all have had, you know, while you've been in your bubble and in competing, what happens when you're at odds? You know, what happens, you've got the 50-some the kids and you're talking about, I don't know, kneeling for the anthem. And, you know, what, what happens when people are in two different places? You know, how have you seen teammates work through that? I think the biggest takeaway I've got is just um, the – the feeling here is to celebrate the differences, like celebrate the difference of opin different opinions, because that's what makes you unique is that you have that opinion and you formulated those thoughts and came to your decision on whatever the, the topic is. Um, but celebrating the fact that you think differently than I, and that's okay. Like that's what makes um, this team special is all the different personalities, all the people from all over the country that are coming together to be on this team and play and just celebrating that rather than putting so much emphasis on, you know, those controversial topics and different things. Um, as far as the anthem go, I know that our player executive committee said, came together and said, you know what, let's, let's not do the anthem because we have players here from all uh, different countries. So for one, are we gonna play all the national anthems? They did, they did make a medley of all of them, but a solution was then they came up with a video that was a spoken word. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen it out there on social media, but I thought it was pretty powerful. And we watched that um, before every game. And the players actually came up with the words in that spoken word. And it talks a lot about diversity and inclusion and our backgrounds where we've came from different income, different places. Um, and I think that's just the mojo that I've had when I got here is that we're celebrating all those differences and that's something I want to take back to my team as well. Thank you. Uh, Betsy, let's, let's come to you. I, I think a lot of coaches are, are just nervous or scared or, you know, when we see some of the questions that have come in and that's, you know, I, I want to talk about racism with my team, but I don't know how to, you know, facilitate the conversation um, you know, we're, we're all, we're all white, every staff member, every player, every, or I want to talk about this, or I feel like they want to talk about this, but how do you help with that? Yeah. And this ties directly into the question that was just asked. And I was taking notes as we go along. Um, if you're an all white staff and you feel like, well, I don't know how to talk about this because we're all white, your players are aware that you're all white. Okay. So part of it is we talk often about having a safe space. I mean, that's the terminology, safe space, safe space. This is a safe space. We're a family. The reality for many of our student athletes and for us as coaches and staff members too, is that even if we've created intentionally this space, there might be reasons that no one else is aware of why I don't feel safe to talk about this thing in this space. So what I found helpful is to rename that creation of space for these conversations as a brave space because it takes us doing things that we may not have done before, doing things in a way that makes us uncomfortable, doing things in a way that challenges us, that calls for some degree of bravery to bring that into that space. And I, I think, I mean, I'm a big Brene Brown fan. Like anyone who wants to be you know, a self-described shame researcher has my ultimate respect. But when she talked about, it was in a podcast at some point, I think she said, or it might've been her Netflix special when she said, when we get to the point where we say in that brave space, I am willing to get this wrong so that we can get this right. And I think sometimes that's, that's a starting point for a step forward to be present with your team and say, I don't know how to do this. And I would rephrase that as I'm learning how to do this. You are the people that I care most about. You're the people that I wanna learn from and learn with and grow with. And so what do we need to establish as guidelines for ourselves to make this a brave space? What's it going to take to feel supported in your effort to be brave? And then have your team come up with, well, in order to be brave in this space, I need to feel like I can say something that's important to me without judgment. I need to feel like I can say something and, um, 
and not be interrupted, you know, mid-sentence. Whatever criteria you come up with to allow people to feel like they can be brave in that space and bring really hard things into a place that's held instead of judged. And you know, we talk about, I'm a, I love food. So it's like, when we think about diversity, if we only salted our food, it would be unpalatable. It's the combination of spices that gives food its richness and its flavor. And it's the same with people. It's our difference of opinion. It's our diversity in the way that we show up in what we look like and where we come from in our backgrounds and our experiences that adds a better quality to our shared experience. So how can we celebrate those things? How can we be brave with those things? How can we create a space that lends itself to understanding about those things through conversation? Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, message Samantha wanted in on something. Samantha, what you got? So we need to take that brave word and blast it. Like I, I was kind of internally cringing when I heard safe space, safe space, because all I hear on the complaint side and the investigation side is that the athletes don't feel safe. And that just, that has a lot of connotations. I mean, not feeling safe has, um, it's loaded, but I love brave. I love it. I love it. We need to take it. We need to sing it from the mountaintops and make sure that that kind of word and, and rhetoric takes over because I, I think you nailed it. I think it is having the courage to talk about things that are difficult, but it really isn't that you don't feel safe because you know, then it makes it, well, then you're, why don't you feel co safe? Because your coach is, you know, abusive or emotionally, you know, this, and, and it just, it goes in a, in a not very good direction for our coaches. And so I'm, I'm so happy. This is like the best thing that I've heard in a long time. Brave, brave space, use the word brave. Like, let's all go back and start using that. And maybe we can get it to really take off in these athletic administrations. Betsy, you have any copyright or anything on that? And we need to, to make sure we're doing anything. No. I really, and it's, I, I'm likely not the first person to, to say it or think it. And that's what I love about communication is there's no ceiling. Like we're never, and that's why I call myself a specialist, not an expert. It's intentional because it would be very egotistical to say, I Betsy know all things about communication. Every conversation I learn from every podcast, every Ted talk, every article I read, every book I read, like it's absorbing information and then putting it back out to people who need it in a way that's digestible, but useful for them. So if you really latched on to brave space, that's wonderful. It's likely not sourced from me, um, but, but it can be the ripple effect can come out from any of us. So run with it, make it yours. I mean, that I think in language, especially anything that as coaches, it's teach and transfer, right? Like we can't play for our student athletes. So the faster we can teach them something in a way that they understand and can latch onto and make their own, it's the same thing with communication. How quickly and how efficiently can we give people tools that are no longer mine, they're theirs. And then I can support them as they put them into practice. Like that's the goal every time. And, you know, I'm curious, and Betsy will stick with you if you have anything to add, and, and we'll move on here too. But when the team disagrees, so we're in a brave space, and we've said, you know what, guys, I'm, I'm, and we'll just keep on this example because we have it, but we, we should absolutely be playing the anthem. Like, choosing to not play it is, is in my opinion, not, not the right choice. Then what? I mean, as a coach, what, what happens next to keep that conversation going in a productive manner? That is the key, right, is productive. Like, how do we keep it going in a way that's productive instead of destructive? And this is when, going back to that silence or violence, you're going to see safety threatened, personal values feel threatened. So pausing for a moment, acknowledging that something has happened or been said that can be triggering, naming the thing so that we take away some of its internal power, uh, following up with questions of, you know, when somebody said this, so and so, it seemed like there there was a reaction that happened physically for you. Is there more that you'd like to say about that? That can be very specific to the individual. Sometimes that's not something they're willing to say in that shared space. But acknowledging that we have a lot of emotions around important topics, and emotions for me are energetic. Like I'll be talking with student athletes or coaches in sessions, and they'll start crying, and they always say, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry," and I say, "No, like." For me, tears are a good thing. Tears mean that you care. That you care so much about something that there's an emotional response happening that's powerful enough for tears to be present. So this is good. This means we're talking about something that matters and that's the stuff I really wanna talk about. So when something, when people are at odds and I think this time, especially with all the different issues and hard conversations that we're having is such a rich opportunity for us to leave this mindset of either or and step fully into both and. 
So yes, we should play the national anthem or no, we shouldn't play the national anthem. Okay, what if both were true for reasons important to those individuals? What's a third option that we co-create together? It's a spoken word poem. And that's something that feels representative and good. And I love that you all did that, Morgan. I think that's so incredible. And I look forward to watching it. But it's like, once we step out of, I'm holding so tightly onto this thing. And the metaphor I like to use is, you know, you can't pick up anything new while your hands are full. So what is it that I can let go of so I can pick up this relationship with my teammates, so I can pick up a new understanding, so I can pick up a different way of thinking about this topic. And again, it doesn't mean I have to agree, but can I understand? That's my challenge in this space. Thank you. Panelists, I have lost track of whose turn it is or because I just, I get stuck listening. So anyone else with anything to add on this question before we go to the next one? If you even remember the question. It's the best part about these. Yeah, it's got it. But I'll just add to that. Too. I think it goes back to how important it is to be really intentional in creating that brave space. You know, as a facilitator, if you're creating some type of, I don't know, expectations, parameters, but, but even if it just that is, is that, you know, this is a, a brave space where there's no judgment, where um, we want to listen with the same passion as we have for being heard, um, that there's no experts in the room. And then also, um, gosh, if Brene knew how much love we were giving to her in this, this session here, but she would also call them permission slips. So those have worked really well in meetings. So it's giving yourself permission for one thing to feel or do in this meeting. Um, so it might be self today, I would give myself permission to be present or I give myself permission to have growth mindset, or I give myself permission today just to sit back and take this all in. And that gives you a good idea, a pulse of where each of your athletes are in that room before you even get into discussion and help hopefully give you kind of a guide to help um, work through that. Because it is, it's, it is gonna get emotional and it should get emotional. And we need to lean into that, um, we need to lean into that discomfort. Thank you very much. A, a little bit different here, but for those teams that are still not available to be in person. So I know, G, you guys are together. Deanna, you guys are together. But um, so maybe, you know, Betsy, we'll start with you and then circle back around. But how do you stay engaged? How do you help newcomers? You know, I think about the newcomers that aren't in person and in the transfer portal and, and oh my goodness, what is that gonna end up looking like? And then how do you have these little everyday connections? We talk about how important they are, you know, passing each other in the dugout and hey, how's it going? And you know, some of those things. Uh, so Betsy, if you wanna kick that off, how, how do we start that and if, or continue it? Some of us have been, you know, virtual since March in a way that's meaningful. Yeah. That's a great question. And it continues to be a great question as we evolve in this space. And it is so context specific. You know, how do I connect with this new person who is an incoming student athlete who didn't have a high school graduation and now can't be with their teammates? And um, for me, it comes back to language, especially no longer being in the coaching space. Like I'll work with teams on activities they can do. I'll work with coaches on conversations they can have. But for me, it really comes back to small connective shifts in our language. So how can we have higher quality conversations? One of the things I recommend often is using someone's name. So Joanna, if you and I are in conversation, there's likely going to be two or three points where we're talking about preparing for this panel, where I'm going to say, you know, Joanna, I really appreciate you, you having this space where we can talk about these things and everyone can grow and learn. And thank you so much, Joanna, for your time. I'm going to say your name two or three times, and you can do this even with people who you know well. It's a small micro acknowledgement that you see them. It's the visual equivalent or the verbal equivalent of a visual acknowledgement. So whether you're on the phone or you actually are face to face through technology. Another thing that you can do, and I love this, again, it's, I don't like to call it manipulation, it's strategy but using what is termed dopamine inducing conversation starters. So by asking a specific question, you can tap into someone's past positive experience and start to generate the bonding chemicals. So dopamine is an oxytocin are the two that we think of when we thought of it, when we think about human connection. So asking questions like, um, what's the best thing that happened to you this week? Now you weren't present for the thing that the student athlete experienced, but by asking them to go there in their memory, that starts the release of those chemicals. And now they associate those chemicals with you in conversation. So these are small things that anybody can do to start to create greater connection, even in limited space, even at you know, geographic distance. Thank you. Scott, anything to add on this one? 
we've had to be obviously be pretty creative. I know everybody is completely uh, burnt out with Zoom here at Mizzou, including our coaches. Um, some things that we started over group me, um, just some fun exercises to have. So we get the freshmen involved too that haven't been on campus or we're still in that transition. Uh, we've done some exercises where you had to find um, a childhood photo of your first experiencing with that sport and talk about why you fell in love with that sport or have a special memory. Again, coaches are doing that too. Uh, the second one was fun is, is they had to pick a song that inspires them or something that they might uh, listen to prior or, or after their sport. And I probably only knew half of them. Not very many of them knew Tom Petty, unfortunately. Um, so that's fun. And then um, a third one the coaches came up with, but someone that's inspired them um, as an athlete throughout their experiences. So that way you get everybody to participate. Um, they can do it on their own time with their with the schedule of school. Um, so just trying to uh, be creative and finding other platforms outside of Zoom. Thank you. You know, Morgan, from a coaching perspective, you know, your university had a, a coaching change over the summer and you're not around, you're playing and, and busy. So you are probably in, in overtime a little bit of, you know, checking in on your players. Anything that you found that was really beneficial or that, that seemed to work well? I think it kind of goes back to that, just getting touches on the athletes whenever you can. So if I were to see something that I knew that athlete could relate to them, just shooting them a short text to let them know that, yes, I'm far away. And yes, we've been apart for a really long time, but I'm still thinking of you and I'm still thinking of our team and the future and the positives in that. Um, and then an exercise that I've like used from um, my coaches in the past is, oh, it's, it's September 12th today. I'm gonna text number 12 on my team and just let her know that I'm, I'm thinking of her. I'm excited to, um, you know, get back to school and see you do great things. Um, I'm excited that you're an engineering major and that's so cool. And anything that can kind of just get more touches on them and it doesn't have to be softball related, like I said earlier. G, let's come back to you. You talked about some of those, maybe, you know, position specific groups or just different ways to, to get them talking to each other. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, uh, that's kind of what we did, too, I, especially kind of going back to the previous question uh, with the freshmen coming in and with the transfers coming in. Uh, and they've said it. They're like, man, it's tough to, like, gauge your teammates' personalities over Zoom. You know, it, it's hard to see, you know, they may not know when I'm joking. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. So I think, you know, because, yes, they were all Zoomed out. Uh, we were zoomed out too. Uh, but a lot of what we did, we started to break it down in, into smaller groups. So, you know, we, we had three different position groups. So instead of having Zoom calls with 15 people every single time, you know, sometimes it was four or five. So you got to know them a little bit better. So now when you get in the, take the part and get back into the hole, you know, now at least they feel comfortable with, you know, three or four other people. So now, you know, when those people are a little more comfortable with someone else, you feel more comfortable kind of interacting. So breaking it down into position groups helped us a, a whole lot, you know, and, and you kind of see it when they get back, you know, and now the ones that, that they had kind of been talking to over the summer a lot more than the others, they're kind of flocking to each other, which is good. You know, you, you kind of see the freshmen come in and, and you're always worried that they won't have anybody to talk to, especially the shy ones, you know, but I think that they've come in and because they had so much time to kind of get to know certain ones, I, I, I think it helped in a way. Thank you. Deanna, anything to add? I only have one thing to add and we stole it from you guys. Um, we stole it from the mentoring session. And when we went on Zoom, we would put, we would ask a question and then we'd stick the girls in different rooms and then they'd have to come up and then they come back. We give them like five minutes. They come up with the answer. We get back together. Then we would send them in a different room. And I didn't do the rooms. I still don't know how to do that. But Jamie did the rooms for me. And it was super fun because they had to be with a different group every time. So that's the only thing I have to add. It's a, a great one and something that I think everybody can do. And, and I'll teach you about those rooms. They're, they're not that tricky. Don't worry. We got, we got you. Uh, 
a good couple questions coming in from the chat here. Um, Scott, I'm gonna start with you on this one. What are some meaningful ways we can get student athletes to start coping with their struggles once they have identified them? For example, if they've decided to come to the realization they're having a hard time or a mental block, how can we get them to start taking steps to be proactive? Yeah, I think if we're going to ask I think it's important to, to set up realistic expectations for them right now. Sometimes expectations are just resentments waiting to happen, especially during this time. Um, I think one thing that's really helped too is, is trying to get athletes, I mean, all of us, to be honest, is to really focus on the being instead of the doing. Like it's, it's kind of productivity looks different now, you know, that we're, we're task people. We like to, you know, we like to go off to task, task, attack and mark things off. Um, and that feels good. And right now that's kind of a hard thing to do. So really setting the attention of how I want to be instead of what I want to do. So what I mean by how do I want to be, how do I want to show up? So when I wake up in the morning, my feet hit the ground, I'm going to be intentional about, I want to show up with gratitude today, or I really want to make sure I show up and am present and in the moment or I, I wanna make sure I'm patient in my interactions today. And if I can see myself and visual, visualize myself through that, I can have a little bit more um, feeling a sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. And, and I think shifting that um, mentality with athletes, especially right now is how they wanna be, even if that's resilient or persevere in the moment, is helping kind of reframe um, the being first doing, let the doing flow from the being. Thank you. And, and a lot of questions here that um, I'm just going to kind of go one at a time on. But again, if any of you want to jump in on any of these, feel free. Uh, Betsy, I'm going to send the next one to you. I think this is my favorite question that we've had. Um, as a male boomer, what is one of the things not already discussed that my players want to tell me, but are reluctant to do so? I mean, that's the magic eight ball question, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, we've put the male, we've put the boomer on there that they want to tell you, but are afraid, like, I don't know. And I don't even know if it has to do with you being male or being a boomer. Like, it just has to be, it has to do with them. And I think that's a, a misconception. And I don't mean this to sound like a judgment, but so often we think people aren't telling us stuff because of who we are. It might have nothing to do with us, you know? Like, it might just be something that they don't wanna tell. Um, I think a great question to ask introspectively is what barriers might exist that may prevent someone from telling me something that is important to them? And then what can I do within my sphere of influence to remove those barriers or to make myself available? Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so many things that could play into it. And a lot of what we think is part of the problem only exists in our mind if we were to ask them directly, you know? And sometimes it's an invitation, like instead of a declaration of, well, they won't tell me this because I'm male, I'm a boomer. Can we flip that into an invitation of, you know, you're someone I'd like to build a better relationship with. And I know we say relationship and it's like male, female right away that gets taken out of context, but like, you're someone I'd like to be able to have really meaningful conversations with. What's it gonna take for, for us to start to occupy that space together? To go off of what Scott had just said, you know, when someone says, I wanna show up as, like, I wanna be more compassionate today. For me, the question we often skip over is, what does that look like? So we talk about like what our values are and what we're committed to, but we fail often to ask that question of what does that look like? When you ask someone, what does that look like? they then have the opportunity to tell you in their own words what it is you can hold them accountable for. And I really like, it's a whole different topic, but that holding accountable, for me, that often sounds like we're just waiting for them to screw up so that we can say, well, you didn't do what you said you were gonna do. So I like to think of that differently as holding able. So how do I help support the individual to do what they said is important for them to do? Um, yeah, that was a, I don't know that that was a clear response to that question. That's a tricky question. And I appreciate you answering it. And I might like at two in the morning be like, this is the thing that would have been helpful to say, but that's what I have right now. I think it's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Deanna, coming to you on the next one. Uh, how do I help my student athletes with their anxiety surrounding the return to activities in the wake of COVID? So that's why I, I, I kind of, I'm going back to one of my answers is I let them, um, well, first of all, that we had to identify, okay, what's the scariest thing about this? Let's talk about it. And then they came up with our team's 
guidelines on to how we were going to handle it to make everybody feel safe. Um, back to that word. Uh, and that um, and that came from them. So, uh, you know, I just said, what do we need to do? How, what's the best thing we can do to keep everybody safe? And then they came up with the protocols. And I think when it comes from them, I think that it really helped with the anxiety. Um, I mean, there's still going to be days, but I think it was important that they came up with it and not me. Thank you, Morgan. I come to you on this one. Um, many of our students are using softball as a release from academic pressures or other things. When they don't have that, um, how can they, you know, better handle different pressures? So, is there anything that you found in, in your time as, you know, a, a stellar athlete that helped you handle those different pressures, or, or if you, you know, have talked to some of your other you know, teammates right now in ways that they're handling some of those things? Yeah, and I think that's where it's important that we teach them what self-care is. You know, so much is, okay, you got to work hard, you got to play softball, you got to do this. And if you ask them maybe what, what do you do for self-care? Like if you have an extra hour, what, what are you doing during that hour? Um, and that kind of may give you a sense of what they like to do, but also teaching them or ways to figure out what works for them. Um, so I'm guilty of right now, I'm playing, I'm juggling coaching, I do a lot of other random stuff on the side. Um, so finding space and time, even if it's just 30 minutes to pick up a book or watch a Netflix show or do something that I enjoy that maybe doesn't involve thinking, um, but trying to find what their athlete enjoys other than softball. It's not like softball is their only passion out there. There's going to be something else they like, whether that's academically or creatively or whatever that is. So giving them, you know, maybe ways to kind of tune into themselves and see, yes, it, it probably is very anxious and stressful that you can't play softball right now or we can't do this or we're only virtually. But if you have all these Zoom meetings, I know I just need to walk outside for a little bit and come back. And that makes the next Zoom meeting so much more tolerable. Um, so just giving them ideas of ways that they can handle the stress and then finding things that they enjoy because softball is not the only thing that's going to make them feel good. And can I share a little vulnerable yeah. thing? So I may, I had to make this for myself like two months in, it's a daily health laminated chart. And it's just the things that I know when I do these things, I am better prepared to show up to give to other people because it's so easy to just try to be responsive, responsive. And I, I was getting into a place like mentally, physically, that was not good for me. And the one on the bottom says less alcohol, more tea, because it like just became that much easier to have that extra glass of wine at the end of a long day. And then you've got five months of long days. So even just something like this, um, whatever that looks like for your individual student athlete. The other thing I've loved that's super short, we think gratitude journal, typically people think, oh, I've got to think of this big thing that I'm really thankful for. Like, no, it can be super simple and really accessible. So the three questions I like to ask student athletes at the end of each day, and it takes less than two minutes to do this is, today I enjoyed, dot, dot, dot. I took care of myself by, and today I enjoyed, I took care of myself by, and I'm proud of myself for. So those three things, today I enjoyed, I took care of myself by, I'm proud of myself for, full stop. And just ask them to think about that. And when they get in the habit of doing that, they start to shift from that anxiety and the depression and the overwhelm that they're in right now for very valid reasons into viewing those same situations a little more positively or in a way that's useful instead of destructive. Thank you. Scott, I wanted to come to you with this question too. Are there just tactics and tips that you give student athletes when you know, you're talking about dealing with these pressures and maybe ways that are different now and, and how they find their release? One opportunity that's came into that is to, to get them back into, I've been trying to get the kids on, uh, kids, student athletes into some more mindfulness meditation. Um, and so there are some free apps, Headspace and Calm. Actually, if you, if you download those, you'll get some uh, basic courses for free. Um, so, so I always encourage them to tap back then, even if it's just a minute or five minutes a day. Um, we have Send Velo through the University of Missouri, which is really nice, and that's been free to all student athletes, um, students, coaches, and staff. So your university might have something similar that you can look into. 
Um, and I also think just getting outside is so important, you know, getting out in nature, um, even if they're online, can they still walk around their campus to feel some type of sense of normalcy? I know that's been huge. My daily chart, number one is get outside. That's so important for my mental health as well. Um, so I'd really encourage um, student athletes to get, get outside and enjoy their teammates outside. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, wanted to um, go to G on this as well. G, is there a way that you've been working with your student athletes as they get back to practice? You know, we get some announcements today on what that NCAA calendar might look like for you guys, but um, anything that you've been doing that's a little different? Uh, I, I coach the wings. So one thing that, that we kind of came together and decided we would do we're going to have wing night. Uh, and they really enjoyed it. They liked it. And not all of them eat meat. So <laughs> we're going to have to figure out exactly what that looks like. Because at first they were like, oh, we're the wings. We can all like have a wing night and we can all get our favorite flavors, whatever, whatever. We can all come together, you know, one night a week and all kind of do that. Because, I mean, I think it's tough with them being back. You can see it like they're in their rooms all day unless they're in workouts, you know, or going to get food or something. So we're trying to figure out something for them just to feel at least somewhat normal. I know like we set up a kickball game, something like anything just to, to try to make them feel, you know, normal again. And I think with, with just me, um, uh, I pick a different one every single day. Every single day we have workouts, I, I pick one out and we sit down and we talk five minutes. Can be about anything. It can be as simple as uh, that TikTok video, I saw you making it, how do you do it? Like, show me the dance, pull it up right now, let's learn it, let's do a TikTok video together, whatever it may be. Like, I, I just always try to, to kind of meet them where they are and, you know, just try to make them feel at least happy for that small period of time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have exhausted our list of questions, which is awesome. Uh, so I'm going to um, go through <laughs> Linda Garza with a little chat in there. I'll let, uh, I'll let you guys handle that one, but uh, we've talked about that, Garza. We've talked about that. So, um, but I'm going to go one more time through the panel. Um, Morgan, you're used to being a leadoff hitter. So I'm going to let you, I'm forget the Z. We're going to let you lead it off, but we'll go, we'll go reverse alpha, but anything you want to add, any closing thoughts, and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I mean, I think there's just been so many ideas thrown out there. And even during COVID, we got so much education and it's really just picking one thing that you're going to do. And for me, that's been huge because I get, oh, I want to do this. Or even if it's for myself, I want to do this more. I want to whatever. Um, so being able to pick one thing to positively impact my student athletes with or positively help myself with has been really important for me. Um, so when going through all these things, just pick something, one thing to take back and um, make your student athletes better with. But connection, I think, is super important. So um, just communicate. It can't, can't necessarily be wrong if you don't even have it to begin with. So start starting that conversation. Thank you very much, Morgan. It's uh, been a pleasure. Gary, how about you? What are your parting thoughts for us? Man, I, I wanted to use this to, you know, learn and grow from it. And I, I just heard so much good stuff. Uh, I really appreciate you all for having me. Uh, this was really beneficial to me. So I don't, I, I feel like we were, I was a panelist, but I felt like I was the one who was, you know, getting to learn and I appreciate it so much. Betsy, what music are you dancing it out to? That's, that's what I want to know. That's, that's my parting thought. Like, I want to know what you're dancing it out to. I'm dancing it out. I'm dancing it out over here. Uh, but yeah, seriously, I, I appreciate this. This was, this was really, really good. Betsy? That's a little embarrassing because, um, so 
I did a, a Peloton ride today and Cody Rigsby is one of the instructors I like to follow. And he did an XOXO Cody ride and it was all ass songs. So baby got back. Like I, I was, I was dancing it out to a lot of, uh, a lot of things were in the rear view mirror today for me. Good so. ones. There you go. I love <laughs> it. We've got a, a couple of Pelotoners on here, and uh, I know Notre Dame staff has a little bit, and there's a lot of people there. Uh, let's see. Who's next? Scotty, you're next. What are your parting thoughts? Um, I, I would just say I'm, I'm having to tell myself this too all the time is be okay with just not getting it right, um, and that – uh, sometimes just being about it is enough. And I know I'm sure as you all are probably some of your harshest um, inner critics and you have high standards and expectations for yourself. So I think you have to have realistic expectations for yourself. And sometimes courage is the compassion piece, which is, um, we don't often put those two together, but give yourself your own self-compassion. Give yourself what you need to get to the next moment. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Deanna, parting thoughts. I, I just want to say thank you. And um, when crazy times, you just, I need to have more fun. So I, this was great. And I laughed a lot. And I'm a big believer if you could not laughing, then you got to do something different. So thanks for making tonight fun and um, make sure that we keep having fun during this crazy, crazy time. Thank you, Betsy, take it home. What do you, what do you got? Gratitude. Thank you so much for creating this space for everyone that asked questions for my fellow panelists uh, for facilitating. You did a great job facilitating this conversation. And I ask the invitation I have is for us all to keep in mind that none of us are at our best right now for so many different reasons. And when in doubt, lead with kindness, be kind to yourself, be kind to those around you and, and really know that the best you have to give right now is enough. Let it be enough. Like, let it be enough. It's okay. And thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us, participating. Like we said, this is available at nfca.org under forums, along with all of the other ones that we have had. Uh, these have been a pleasure to be a part of. And I caught myself being a spectator several times, just had the coach's voice in my in my head, if buy a ticket, you know, <laughs> stay involved. But uh, it was uh, it was great. I loved it. You'll see in your chat. You're gonna have more information. Our next educate to elevate is coming up October 14th. So go ahead and mark your calendar there. We'll have uh, some more great information for that. And don't forget, virtual convention is coming your way. So make sure you're marking your calendars. Check out the website. Speaker reveals continue to come. It's gonna be a ton of fun and uh, you're gonna learn a lot. So thank you everyone for joining. These panelists are fantastic and I know that they will be open for follow-up. So if you're sitting there thinking, I wanna know more about something, reach out. That's why we're here, that's why we do what we do and just uh, can't thank you enough, especially those of you that uh, come from outside the softball world, not as familiar with our group and uh, embrace and help us learn. So thanks everybody. We will be back next month and uh, keep your calendar open. We've got a lot of great stuff coming your way. Have a wonderful night and thanks for joining us.